<laughs> Thank you. Um, really appreciate Jen, um, <coughs> Elena, Ling, and uh, Ben, and all, everybody at the National Committee. Uh, in many ways, this book really is a product of me becoming public intellectual, because the book was written for a much larger um, audience. And we wrote it, Piper and I are both um, academics, and uh, but we wrote it for both people who want to get a quick you know, inroad into understanding Chinese cities, as well as students who want to begin studying uh, Chinese cities. So um, uh, very much appreciate the uh, <coughs> exposure to um, the National Committee's uh, public intellectual program. So, okay, so in the next 40 minutes or so, I am not going to really walk you through the entire book. You have the books there if you're interested. And uh, um, I want to really focus on perhaps two big, you know, sort of um, themes. Um, and in the first part, so we we'll really look at the scope and pace of change from both in terms of how cities and urbanization have evolved on the national scale across China. And then second, I want to look at how from within cities, uh, both the space as well as urban life have changed. So, so we're looking at sort of spatial uh, relationships, both uh, you know, across cities as well as within cities. I also, you know, when Piper and I wrote this book, we were thinking to ourselves, if we are introducing Chinese cities and Chinese urbanization to a larger audience who perhaps know a lot more about American cities, a lot more about European cities, what is so unique about Chinese cities and what is so unique about urban China? So we also wanted to not so much challenge um, the conventional theories and, 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 and experience. But we really want to bring also, but we do want to bring to your attention, you know, the uniqueness of, of China's urbanization, perhaps uh, the implications of China's continuing urbanization for the rest of the world. So in the next, you know, uh, 40 minutes or 30 minutes or so, I want to walk you through uh, that as well. So, um, so off the bat, um, the book is not written as a typical scholarly manus, um, monogram. So in a sense, we didn't have a sort of a major theory or major argument or major uh, 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 statement. We wanted to lay out the a comprehensive landscape of urban changes and root it in historical uh, background. So we have a number of chapters devoted to talking about urban China pre-reform, even though the book focuses on uh, post-reform period, that is after 1979. But there are a number of chapters in the book that are, uh, are about classical and traditional Chinese cities, both in terms of their form as well as in terms of their geography. So if you are interested in that part, the book has really quite a nice sort of pool of knowledge in that aspect. So. We all know China is urbanizing at a very fast pace. So today, uh, much like the rest of the world in general, China is about half urbanized. That is to say about half of the people in China now live in urban areas. And some of the largest cities in the world now are in China. And about 10% of China, uh, the world's population now live in Chinese cities. So, it's astounding in terms of the numbers. <clears throat> and so how did China get there in a matter of you know, 40 years, right, since 1979? When 1979, the reform began, China's urbanization rate, i.e. percentage of people living in cities, were roughly 18% to about 20%. Today is about 50%. So over a matter of 30 years, we've seen significant growth of cities, both in terms of numbers 
and in terms of the number of population, the amount of population live in cities. And we all agree, many, many scholars agree, this rapid pace of urbanization is really a result of a number of you know, um, large forces working in the Chinese society, which in many ways uh, is, I wouldn't call it different from other emerging economies or developing countries, but more intense than those countries. So I'm, I just want to quickly put our sort of conversation in that large context. That is, the major forces going on in the Chinese society. All of you probably are quite familiar with these, particularly in terms of market reform, and in terms of globalization, how much China has opened up its doors to the uh, global market, but also in terms of how um, increasingly both responsibilities and resources have decentralized from the central government level to local levels in a sense promoting sort of the incentives at the local levels to grow the cities as well as to grow the economies of the cities. And then industrialization and last but not least migration. So if you go to let's say Thailand or the Philippines, what you are going to see at work are most likely two major forces, right? Uh, decentralization, industrialization, to some extent migration. You go to Brazil in the 1950s or 60s, you're going to see industrialization, you're going to see migration and globalization. You go to uh, India today, you are going to see obviously uh, also industrialization, migration and globalization. But almost no country around the world in the last 30 years has had all these large forces working together in a way pushing migration forward uh, much more forcefully in a much rapid pace. So here's the uh, uh, urbanization at a glance. And you can see the uh, drastic, both in terms of scope and pace of change. And as I mentioned, the level of urbanization has uh, gone up to about 51% as of uh, a couple of years ago. But more drastically, I think, is the growth in the number of cities. They're essentially um, basically uh, tripled, and particularly in terms of the very large cities, as the Chinese call them super large or extra large. And in fact, uh, China has uh, at least half a dozen what we call mega cities, that is beyond 10 million uh, population. So you think about Shanghai, you should think about Beijing, Tianjin, uh, Chongqing, in fact, are all what we call mega cities. Um, and New York, anybody ready? sort of have a, a guess of New York metropolitan area, the size of population? Yeah? 20, uh, 16. 16? 15. 15? 19 and 15. Okay, so let's see, if we, let's see if we use the Census Bureau definition of the <coughs> metropolitan area. It's about 11 million. So we are much smaller, right? So, you know, Beijing today has roughly 18 million, Shanghai has roughly 21 million, um, and that is if we count the migrants, and if we don't count the migrants, it's about three or four million less in each city. So the Chinese cities are really also larger in terms of uh, a number of population. That is actually based on a much stricter definition of urban. Again, I'm gonna quiz you, don't feel like you're a student, I just like doing that. So if in the United States, by census definition, a place could be called urban if it has a population of how much? Three million. Three million? Uh, no, 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 no way. 50,000. 50, 50, 50, 50, Anybody else? Especially the students sitting around the table. <laughs> 10,000. 10,000? 250,000. 250,000. As a count? <laughs> no. You see, urban places can have the name of cities or town or county in this case of the state of Virginia where I used to live. Um, so urban doesn't necessarily come with the designation of city. City is just a, a certain type of urban place because it's used as a certain type of government structure. So in the United States, it's 2,500 for an incorporated place to be what? classified. Yes, 2,500. It's not much, right? That's why, <laughs> that's why United States is 80% urbanized. 
<laughs> right? So um, Canada and Mexico are roughly about the same, 4,500. It has a lot to do with the geography, right? Because we are much land rich and in terms of population, a lot less density. For those of you who have, who have been to China, the first thing you will notice once you walk on the street is the number of people. Now that definition actually goes further down. If you go to northern Scandinavian countries, it becomes about 200 for an incorporated place to be classified as urban. Of course, the primary economic activities need to be non-agriculture. That's another kind of uh, major feature. In China, the definition has changed uh, three times over the last um, 50 years or so since the 1960s of what qualifies as cities or urban areas. But in general, what we're looking at is in the tens of thousands of people, so usually 20,000 people to, for a place to be classified as urban. So it's a much stricter standard to uh, be called urban. So in a sense, this 51% could be 70% if we use the American definition. Uh, so this is to say these <coughs> numbers actually, in a way, mask uh, some of the rapid growth uh, of urbanization, uh, as well as a um, uh, uh, number of cities. But there's also another uh, qualification, I shall say. In China, uh, how many of you have been to Shanghai or Beijing, these large cities? Great. How many of you have been to outside of downtown of Beijing, sort of more to the suburban areas? Yes. So would you say that you go to Tongxian or uh, uh, the Dashan's near the Great Wall area, um, does it feel like urban to you? No, it doesn't, right? Because Beijing as a municipality, um, 80 million people equivalent to New York City, not the metro area, just New York City, 6 million people. So politically is at the same level, but a Chinese city is really more like a metropolitan area. And so you have both very urbanized areas in the middle, as well as much more suburban, I wouldn't even call it suburban, I call it rural areas on the off periphery. So that in a way overestimate urbanization. So those forces come together, actually roughly balance out. So 50% is a pretty good uh, a capture of the level of urbanization uh, in China. So that kind of growth in one way is very, very unique. And there are only about three countries in the world uh, that are somewhat, including China, that are somewhat similar in that growth. So again, if we go to other countries in East Asia or Asia in the region of a similar level of development or wealth, so we think about uh, China now is what we call middle income uh, country, according to the World Bank uh, uh, classification. So you would think uh, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Philippines of roughly similar income levels. Uh, you go to all of those countries, right? I count uh, particularly Thailand, Malaysia, Mal uh, and uh, Philippines. What you notice is you have a very large city, the capital city, that dominates the entire urban system, and that's called urban primacy. So the rule of thumb across the world is as countries move up in the development level, they begin to urbanize, they also begin to see the dominance of the largest city decline. So only when you reach a fairly high level of income, you will become a country like the United States where you have multiple cities that are very important. Now that's not to say all rich countries are like that. If you think of France, you think of um, Japan, they do have dominance of a very large city. That's historically and geographically unique features of some of the wealthy countries. But basically, poor countries tend to have these primate cities. China is one exception, India is another, another Russia is a third. That has a lot to do with the rule of the government in managing urban growth. So even in the post-reform period, 
the Chinese urbanization has never become sort of this top-heavy uh, sort of imbalanced system in which one city or two, in the case of Brazil, you see two cities dominate. And that's why I say um, sort of the rule of policies is really important. Nonetheless, history and geography both dictate a rather sort of significant disparity across regions, which I will show you just now. So this is China. Um, this is roughly based on uh, data in uh, 2008 to 2009 in terms of population size of various different cities. We portrayed pretty much only cities at a certain level we would call prefecture level cities, that is sort of medium sized and large cities, not the you know, really, really small ones you see dotted all over the place. So the Chinese geography is such that there are three officially designated regions, eastern, central, and western. And we also know the Chinese geography is very uh, uh, uneven. If you draw a line from um, the top here in the north in Heilongjiang province, and then to the bottom southwest here in Yunnan, and that's called Peng Chong Ai Hui Lai. Peng Chong is here, Ai Hui is here, Peng Chong Ai Hui Lai. 40% of territory is to the east of the line, 60% of territory is to the west, 95% of the population lives to the east of the line, and 5 to 6% of the population lives to the west. So it's very different geography from, let's say, United States. In terms of physical size, China is roughly the same size, just slightly bigger than the United States. And in terms of dimensions, also very similar east-west and north-south. But geographically, in terms of geographical distribution of population, is extremely difficult, a uh, different. And in terms of resource <coughs> distribution, also extremely different. Much of the resources are to the west, and except you know, if you look at a rice growing, sort of the more uh, favorite climate uh, in terms of precipitation is in this corner. And this is where the rice culture really is. The rest of China is much, uh, particular to the north, is more wheat-based uh, uh, diet. And um, population-wise, is really concentrating on this side. And that's why you see the kind of distribution of cities predominantly sort of uh, located to the east of Aihui and Tongtong Line. Okay? and particularly the very large cities. Um, so urbanization obviously is, has proceeded uh, at a rapid pace across the country, but um, as you will see here, that the eastern region, the percentage <coughs> of growth is far higher <coughs> than the other two regions. And that also has to do with how reform period government policies uh, favor the eastern regions, particularly the coastal cities, and migration also favored that region, and uh, infrastructure investment, so on and so forth. So there are lots of different indicators that are showing that eastern region is the sort of favored uh, area during the reform period, which then reflects in this. So, in a way, urbanization uh, is uneven across the regions, as well as uh, uh, income growth um, across regions. Another significant uh, uh, disparity in China across regions is this rural-urban income gap. Uh, it's growing over time. In fact, if anything, in 1980, when reform first started, China perhaps was more equal than it is today. Both in terms of, you see the uh, uh, gap between rural and urban income, as well as in terms of regional uh, 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 disparity. So in many ways, that reform period has made everyone a little richer, but the speed at which people are getting rich uh, uh, is very different across regions and across uh, rural and urban areas. 
And so this growth of cities, the number of cities, and also in terms of urban population, in many ways is natural. So people move from rural areas to urban areas, and smaller urban areas grow to be larger and larger. So we call that you know, natural growth, or in demography, we also call the migration call uh, uh, as mechanical growth. But in the Chinese urban system, there's the important element of policies at work. So I just want to use this as sort of case in point to illustrate that urbanization is significantly managed by the central government. In the more recent decades, two most, the two most important policies are these. That is, um, okay, so can you see in the back? Okay. Um, before reform started, this was the more prevalent um, government structure at the local level. You have provinces, 30 of them. Under provinces, you have prefectures, which are very similar to counties in New York, the state of New York and many states in the United States. Uh, and then under prefectures, you will have cities and you have rural uh, jurisdictions that will be called counties. So cities and counties are generally set, more generally <coughs> separated. But after 1979, especially since the policies of cities govern counties in the 1990s, the more prevalent forms of government structure in sub-provincial level is this one. That is, cities now become the prefectural jurisdiction. So think about Nanjing or Shanghai and Beijing are different because they're provincial level cities. So think about cities that are uh, a little smaller than Shanghai and Beijing. So think about Shi uh, Jiazhuang or Nanjing or Hangzhou. They are all what we call prefectural level cities. They are more like me uh, metropolitan regions. Under um, these cities, so Nanjing or like Suzhou, and, you know, a lot of you have heard of Suzhou, right? Just one hour outside of uh, uh, Shanghai. Suzhou, underneath Suzhou, you will have another city called Kunshan. Anybody's heard of Kunshan? Which has been the home to many Taiwanese investment, Taiwanese firms. It's 40 minutes outside of Shanghai. So that's another city. But it, it doesn't report directly to Jiangsu province. It reports to Suzhou municipality. So that's a county level city under the prefecture level city. And then Suzhou also have a number of counties that are more or less rural reporting to it, as well as a number of urban districts within the old Suzhou city. So now you, from this structure, you can see the prefecture level cities, all um, uh, 200 of 80 some of them in the country, really are metropolitan areas. They have both urban and rural and semi-urban tucked in between. And so that is very much the result of this policy of cities leading counties. So many rural counties, something like 1,200 counties, were moved to be part of large cities. So that obviously bumped up urbanization level. And other counties then uh, were also reclassified as uh, uh, cities or as urban uh, districts. So, case in point, um, everybody's probably heard of Chongqing, right? It's where yeah. the Three Gorges stand, basically at top of it, uh, um, you know, on the start part before it uh, uh, was built. Uh, Chongqing used to be a city within Sichuan province. And in 1997, it was made to be the fourth city directly under the central government. So it's a provincial level city now. And so by doing that, the central government also merged the original Chongqing city with 40 surrounding counties. And so the population immediately changed from 15 to 30 million land area multiplied. So 
take a look at this map here. So the old Chongqing city is just this much. And so the new Chongqing city is that. So all of a sudden, Chongqing is the largest city in China by pure number of population and land area. Now, obviously, most scholars disagree because that is just administrative reclassification. Uh, nonetheless, it, it is very important. And it really has become uh, a, a very sort of important player, not partially, significantly also because of um, Bo Xilai being appointed uh, of its first mayor after the reclassification. Um, and you know, the reason it was reclassified also had to do with its importance in the upper Yangtze Delta, because the rest of the Yangtze Delta, Shanghai and so on, this was more inland <coughs> and closer to uh, Sichuan province, which is the most dense, in terms of most populated province in China. So it's another kind of area in which much more investment uh, from the public sector would have gone into. So that kind of um, uh, a reclassification uh, really happened across the country uh, since uh, the 90s, which really sort of complicated uh, the sort of our understanding of how urbanization has proceeded. Otherwise, it would be called naturally if we had studied other countries around the Asian Pacific region. Despite that kind of reclassification of Chongqing or um, other counties and so on, we see the dominance essentially of three very large, what we call city regions or urban regions. And these regions are centered around three very large cities, Shanghai, Beijing, and Guangzhou, and are the most important destinations of foreign investment and also public investment in terms of government. Okay, so what you're seeing here, this was 2008 data. So this cluster, and then here, this is Shanghai, so the lower Yangtze. This is Bohai Rin, and then this is uh, Pearl River Delta. So these are the key regions uh, in um, China's uh, urban system today. And uh, Mackenzie did a consulting report <coughs> a couple of years ago and projected a number of scenarios in terms of how cities would grow in terms of geographically. This is one of the scenarios, and we believe this is most likely the uh, potential sort of uh, scenario that will turn out in the next 30 to 40 years. As I mentioned, so changes are not only at the cross city level, but also at the uh, sort of the urban space level that uh, we begin to see a drastically different kind of urban landscape uh, within Chinese cities. And I particularly want to uh, sort of bring to your attention the uh, kind of sort of the old sort of nostalgia image of cities in China that I grew up in, sort of the egalitarian, low-profile, walking-scale city, really is changing particularly after 1999 when working units were no longer allowed to provide housing. So the linkage between work and residence has all but disappeared. I grew up, I grew up in the college compound in which you know all my parents, colleagues, all my uh, friends, parents all work together, we live together, so that kind of community is no longer uh, uh, sort of the case in many uh, Chinese cities, or in all Chinese cities, except you have legacies um, um, from the old uh, era. And this just give you some numbers, you probably have seen it in terms of sort of how travel also become more uh, uh, motorized, both uh, in most of the cities, and this gives you the change in Shanghai over time. Of course, you see, huh, there's a sort of uh, exception here. That's because of very restrictive policies used in Shanghai that I can talk about if you yeah, have so any. I think you need to 
Can you tell us that? in the yeah, back I don't know that oh, I see. what, what the, the cross hatchings are and right. the indicators on the side are? Right. Um, okay, so let's go back to this one. I want you to really just pay attention to this part. Uh, this part is uh, car. Cars. Yeah, car travel. And uh, this part is walking. So pre-1979, uh, this would be roughly here, although I don't have good numbers for different cities. I only have it for Shanghai. So as you can see, with exception of Nanning, which is in Guangxi province, most of these large cities, Ningbo, Hangzhou, Chengdu, and Beijing now have 30 to 40 percent of all travel be counted by automobile, which is pretty high for Chinese so you can just, well, I think it's interesting, show what, tell them what the others are, the public transit. Oh, okay, so yeah, the public transit is this dark color, and so in, uh, in Hangzhou it's fairly uh, good, but in some other cities are not very good. And then um, this is uh, bicycles. bicycles, actually, oh no, bicycles really small now, as you can see, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I mean, you know, for those of you who have been to China, it's really difficult now to ride bikes uh, oftentimes. And, and so this is a better portrait because this has over time for Shanghai from 1982, 1988, 1995, 2004. And then you see the car travel increasing drastically through mid-90s. But in the last 15 years or so, Shanghai has used very restri restrictive uh, uh, regulations over car ownership, and that's why we're seeing it uh, coming down. Okay, uh, and then public transportation continues to be fairly good in Shanghai. Okay, and, and what is the top level? Oh yeah, this one. Um, actually, correct myself. This is actually bicycling. Really? That yeah. Still. Yeah, still actually rather large. Yeah. 2004. So. Yeah, this is 2004. Mm -hmm. Well, Shanghai's climate is also a little bit more conducive for bicycling because it's warmer. Um, okay. So um, that's one thing that's really uh, uh, changing uh, drastically. As you can see from these images, I mean, I have the text lining out there, but I think I also want you to sort of draw your attention to uh, not only in terms of sort of modes of travel have multiplied in different ways, the type of neighborhoods also has multiplied in different ways. So in downtown, Sh all of this are Shanghai. In downtown Shanghai, you have very old Lino in the uh, 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 Shikumen kinds of structure, very high end, uh, often foreign invested. Uh, residential areas. Also, this is just five minutes walk from here. This is Xintian Di, the new heaven and earth development. And then you move to Pudong, which is across the river to the east. You have um, what we call urban villages. They used to be rural, but now increasingly redeveloped, but still some kind of urban, sort of rural uh, uh, housing left, and many of which now are occupied by migrants and newly developed commercial residential complexes in suburban areas. So you have sort of this juxtaposition of very different kinds of neighborhoods. So when I was growing up, cities tend to be more equal. That is, you go to different parts of city, you don't see the wealthy or the less wealthy, you see less of that. But today, Shanghai began to have what they had before 1949, that was the upper corners or the lower corners. That is more differentiated and uh, uh, urban space within the city. And as you can also see from the map, you, all you need to pay attention, uh, this shading scheme is by the percentage of migrants among the total population in all of the uh, sub-districts, what we call Jidao in Shanghai metropolitan area. So the darker means more migrants live in these uh, neighborhoods. So you could see the migrants tended to, this was 2000, it's not the most recent because 2010 census data are not available yet at this level. And so you can see that most migrants concentrate right outside the downtown, the, the most important districts here. Uh, so they're in Pudong and uh, 
啊，嵩山，呃，闵行 ，and， 呃，哦，呃 ，and then this is 松江 ，this is not 吴淞 ，so these areas now are where you're gonna see many of these quote unquote urban villages. So you have different parts of the city、uh, housing different kinds of、uh, residents. And these are the kind of、uh, sort of residential environments that you will see for migrants. Now, obviously, these are migrants generally are from rural areas and are migrant workers. We do, we have seen migrants who are living in regular apartments, but these are the more sort of lower income and also working migrants that either work in small workshops, vegetable vendors. These are、um, in Shanghai on rivers in terms of transport vegetables, and, and these are、um, migrants who come to suburban areas in cities to work on the farm. So you have different kinds of migrants quarter and different kinds of um, migrant um,、uh, population. And last but not least is this kind of diversified economic space. I.e., where you shop, where you uh, uh, go for、um, uh, industrial or financial kinds of functions in the cities, is also becoming quite、uh, what we call polycentric. That is, we have lots of different centers. Again, I'm using Shanghai as an example. That is,、uh, this is the new Pudong Central Business District, and all of the stars are the what we call economic and technology. Development zones where you see lots of foreign investment going in. So that's on the production side. In terms of the consumption space,、um, you also see quite sort of different kinds of centers. The most expensive on Nanjing Road, right?、Um, and then the least expensive, perhaps、uh, for local residents, is in、uh, Yuyuan Garden, and it's also catered to.、Uh, Tourists and stuff, but you can see the quality of the buildings tends to be much lower and older and so on. This is more heritage tourism.、Uh, this is、um, in Huai、uh, uh, Luan District.、Um, this is actually Shenzhen. This is not Shanghai, but you can also see this is more what we call mass market consumption space. So you have a highly differentiated. Uh, uh, consumer space as well, in, in addition to the highly differentiated what we call residential space that I just showed you a couple of images ago. <coughs> so that gives you a sense of、uh, sort of what's changing within cities. And、uh, so to finish the, my uh, uh, sort of little tour with you is that.、Um, We see China unique in a number of ways, and particular in terms of the rule of government as being quite central. And many scholars call the local governments as a developmental state. And I won't go through this, and, but you will see, and may, we may have questions later on on this point. And that kind of instrumental sort of function of the state. Also has created an urban system that is uh, uh, rather unlike most other developing countries, in much more balanced fashion. And these few things,、um, you know, perhaps this hybrid urban landscape is a little bit more that I've illustrated. And these we haven't really talked about, but if you have interest, we can talk more about these. Essentially, Chinese cities continue to be centrally anchored. That is the most expensive real estate. The most vital points of Chinese cities tend to still be in the center, so we're not seeing the hollowing out of cities as American cities had in the 20th century. We also are not seeing the kind of suburbanization that American cities have seen in the 20th century. In fact, if anything, China's suburbanization is very unique. So, to look into the future.、Um, Given that market forces are increasingly driving both housing development, transportation services, as well as、um, 
certainly, you know, the, 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 the jobs that we're seeing, we anticipate that Chinese cities are going to become more stratified, both within and across. That is, within cities, in terms of residential space, consumer space, we're going to see more, you know, upper corners and lower corners, and then across cities, we are going to see western cities continue to lag, and coastal cities continue to lead, and the gap will continue to, if not growing, certainly to come to maintain at the current levels. And uh, we, you know, I didn't talk about this, but certainly in our book we talked about this, is we also see that uh, China already has a very sort of delicate and fragile um, relationship between the human uh, environment and the natural environment that is continue that will continue to uh, uh, grow and perhaps for many scholars this could be the undoing of China's growth and this particularly in a more sustainable fashion so uh, in our book we did talk about that for one chapter and um, if you're interested I'd be happy to entertain any questions so anyway um, I think I've run over my time. Okay. Uh, and uh, so I'd be very happy to take questions, comments, and you know, um, to uh, discuss with you uh, any of the you know, points we've gone through or points we haven't gone through. Okay, we'll take questions. Um, we'll start with you and then Frank. And, and please give us your name and where you're from. So we'll be next to you. Okay, I'm Alexander Levine. I go to Ford University. Um, so my question was, do you see any of the cities emer like in the West like, be, um, emerging as a, as a mega city or um, in the way that, I mean, I know it's obviously a big city now, but mm -hmm. um, like other cities in the East. Okay. Do you want to take one? Okay. Let's start with that. Okay. okay. All right. So let me pull out this map here with the uh, investment distribution uh, by foreign uh, sources, right? So uh, you actually are not seeing Kunming at all, right? So um, despite the fact that domestic investment is, dri is driving uh, most of the uh, economic growth in China, the fastest growth tends to have happened in places where FDI, foreign direct investment, has been significant. We've all, I've also done work looking at infrastructure investment in terms of how that promotes economic growth. The patterns are very similar. You know, infrastructure growth, uh, investment, and economic growth were the fastest in this part of the country in the 80s and 90s. And as reform moved up north, and then uh, the lower Yangtze River and the um, uh, 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 Bohai Rim, have become the recent fo foci. The, the issue with Kunming, to, to my view, a, as well as many other scholars, is its somewhat isolated location. So if you look at even here, we see that this might be a potential emerging mega city region, or at least uh, urban region. So you have Chengdu and Chongqing, and not far you have Wuhan, right? And then you have Yichang in between. That's a possibility because these uh, second tier cities tend to specialize in their economic functions. And so with another or two cities surrounding it, it can complement and be more uh, competitive together. And the Kunming, on the other hand, um, really is all by itself. But is, it, is it not strategically located in that it's just in relation to where it is, where, mm -hmm. where it is in relation to Southeast Asia, that can be good. Yeah, sure. I mean, but it's mostly tourism, and mostly also, you know, for, unfortunately, a lot of informal economies going on. And so um, it doesn't have significant, uh, both in terms of manufacturing, as well as service activities that are more highly uh, value added. And it doesn't have another large city, or at least medium-sized city, that's very close to it. So that is the uh, <coughs> uh, disadvantage of that. Chinese scholars used to talk about the Frank Hale, by the way, Frank Hale, U.S. China exchanges. Uh, 
Chinese scholars used to talk about the floating population. It's a term that seems not to be in use so much anymore. Mm -hmm. I always thought it was a misnomer. Mm -hmm. But in any event, it kind of as the, the lack of use currently seems to reflect a new understanding of migrant labor. And to your point about managed urbanization, one way to manage it is to either be strict or loose on the enforcement of hukou and residence. Um, about five years ago, I was in the, in the Pearl River Delta, and I found that it didn't make any difference where you came from. You could get a job right. anywhere in the Pearl River Delta, whether your children could come and get educated. That was a different story. But you, that didn't make any difference. So what other technique, first of all, when did this term cease to be used or decline in use? And second, what other methods, other than hukou enforcement, did the Chinese government use to manage urban growth? Because unlike Brazil, say, mm -hmm. no squatter areas. Yeah. Um, actually, interesting, uh, Liu Dong, uh, floating population is a direct translation of Liu Dong Ren Kou. So if you go to China today, you still see the term being used quite a bit. We still call it living work. We call it domingo, that's uh, migrant workers. And so the, work, the term is actually still being used. But you're absolutely right in terms of over time since 1983 to today, that the overall policy sentiment and popular sentiment towards migrants hasn't really moved in a more positive direction in a sense, it, uh, seeing them as a more positive aspect of the urban growth, as well as uh, seeing them as an inevitable uh, uh, product of the uh, rapid industrialization of China, right? So um, uh, that term is actually still going on, and the magnitude of migration continues to grow. Now we're looking at a stock about 200 million. Now only uh, about, Two thirds to three quarters of which are really what we call migrant workers. Floating population is a large, all capture all kinds of terms because that also includes uh, tourists, students, and so on that come to a different place, a place different from their place of household registration, Google. right? So that's why it's not used quite as much. Migrants are used much more because we're really you know, the scholarly attention is really more on the workers who come away, go away from their uh, uh, original residence. Another, I think, factor to that is because since the 2000 census, migrants are now counted at their destinations. Before that, it was never counted. So there was always this category of people that was different from the local residents. So now they are all counted together as Changzhu Renko, what we call what they call the permanent residents. So you, you don't use that term quite as much as well. In terms of your second question, in terms of what else is used to contain the growth uh, of particularly uh, cities that are very large, uh, Hukou actually <coughs> is less useful now in smaller and medium-sized cities, which is an incentive for migrants to go to those cities. On the other hand, if you go to very large cities, Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, and so on, Hukou is really, really important in terms of gaining access to public education for children, and state sector jobs, and affordable housing. Um, and so migrants really have restricted access to those things. And in terms of you know, the lack of um, squatter settlements, it's a really fascinating topic. You know, in 1996, I went to Brazil for the first time. I saw all of the favelas, and that's actually why I began to study migration in China, is that what you're seeing is a much uh, uh, effective and a strong state in terms of resistance to the sort of organized uh, migrant movements. In fact, if anything, migrants are the least organized labor force in China, even though there have been here and there different protests, but sort of collective 
you know, the kind of social movements we have been seeing in Latin America have never happened in China among the migrant population. So you go to Shanghai, you hardly ever see squatter settlements of any substantive scale because the cities continue to come in, the municipal government come in and clear it out anytime you have some significant scale. Even in Beijing, we know the Zhejiang Tun, the Zhejiang village where a lot of winter migrants have congregated just south of Tiananmen Square. They've gone through five rounds of uh, clearing, much like you know the urban renewal in American cities, but the sort of slum clearance. But in this case, it was sort of getting rid of quote unquote illegal buildings by the migrants. So there's a very uh, systematic way of uh, maintaining sort of the land uh, uh, surveillance, because also the land ownership is very different. In Brazil, you have private ownership, and you also have squatter laws, in which make, which makes it very difficult to kick squatters off the land if they've been there a certain amount of time and with permanent structure. In China, you don't have that legal structure to give migrants the kind of squatters' rights. After a sort of so what happens when they're cleared out? They're, they're gone. They're basically... Where, where, where do they go? So they keep moving out to other parts of the city. and uh, Or uh, now it's not quite as common. Up to the mid-90s, there have been these, what we call I don't know how to say it in English, sort of collection uh, uh, stations for migrants without proper temporary um, residence permit because all migrants who come to the city are supposed to get this one year temporary residence permit or they cannot demonstrate that they have a steady job. So they have these qian song zhan or the uh, collection stations where they um, sort of house temporarily migrants without proper papers and then they are sent back to their home uh, towns. Now that's no longer working. I've actually visited some of them in the mid-90s, and that's not working because it's actually created a lot of tension and social unrest, and uh, ultimately uh, lead to a very um, uh, publicized event in 2003 in Shenzhen, where uh, my brother was beaten to death because he didn't have any documentation. And so in 2005, there was a uh, central uh, circular that sort of, in a way, require local government <coughs> to protect the rights of my kids. So at least on occasion. Yeah. Okay, so, um, Tristan Zhang, Felix Capital Partners. My question is um, with regards to the the, uh, the significance of um, of uh, urbanization rates with respect to the, um, well, with relation to the water shortage mm -hmm. in these type of cities. Because as we all know, um, there's a significant shortage of water uh, in northern and western parts of China. So right. What is the Chinese government doing uh, in the future to really kind of uh, try to resolve this problem and you know, try to uh, beef up the infrastructure as required to to really you know ramp up ramp, ramp up this type of uh, uh, situation? Right. Uh, structure. And, and, is it, and is it true that Beijing, because of the deep crisis in water, Beijing is already beginning plans to move the city elsewhere? I haven't heard of that. Mm -hmm. Not an entirety of it. Okay. But there's always been, you know, for Beijing, there's always been different scenarios of moving certain parts to a different uh, location. But three things have been done, at least three things. One is, you know this national project called Nan Shui Bei Diao, Southern Water Going to the North. Okay, so that's not serving just Beijing or a few cities, it's actually serving the entire Northern Plain region. Because as you said, as you said, the water shortage is primarily uh, uh, sort of really severe in the northern cities. Um, so the Nan Shui Bei Diao have three different routes. It's essentially taking water from the uh, natural tributaries in the south and through large uh, aqueduct darks into the north. Right? It's very expensive kind of investment. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, second is uh, what we call um, uh, large investment in water treatment. Mm -hmm. Only about uh, 30% of all wastewater in Chinese cities is treated 
And, uh, and, and we also know most, uh, you know, if you go to China, you don't drink from the tap because it's not portable. But at least some of the treated water can be used for industrial, what we call gray uses, that it doesn't need to be a certain high standard. So the investment in water, wastewater treatment has been significant since the late 90s, and especially through what we call uh, private participation. So there have been a very large number of uh, Western firms, particularly from France and England, mm -hmm. Times Water, Vivian Water uh, from, from France, have all invested in very large treatment facilities. For instance, Chengdu has a very large one, Shanghai has several very large ones. So in a way of also uh, creating uh, water for great uses. And third is, as you were say, uh, said in terms of aging infrastructure, uh, some of the water wastage comes from old infrastructure because the delivery of water to households essentially gets siphoned off half of it on their way to the households. Mm -hmm. So the investment in the newer infrastructure would hopefully uh, yeah, be more efficient and help with the water shortages. And so that's, yeah. I should clarify, I shouldn't have said move the city elsewhere. I should have said move the capital elsewhere. Oh, I see. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay, in that. Hi, uh, I'm Chris Knudsen of the Lloyd's Chinese Services Group. And my question is in the same vein, it's on sustainability. Uh -huh. um, it seems to me that uh, I mean, each year that I've gone to China, you know, things seem to be reaching, uh, in terms of sustainability of organization, uh, almost sort of, uh, sort of new heights of, uh, I, I kind of characterize it among both expats and also domestic Chinese. I know. So it levels of anxiety in most, in terms right. of congestion, mm -hmm. air quality, food safety, all of these issues, long mm -hmm. stream issues that kind of broadly can be plugged into sustainability. Mm -hmm. And then when you go visit Chinese cities, there's lots of things they'll show you in terms of, you know, show the map of Shanghai, there's the German Island about how we're going to create this green. Right. There's so much of this. Mm -hmm. um, Echo City. Yeah, it's Echo City. Whole so we're doing this, we're doing that. You see that throughout the country, and mm -hmm. the problems are getting worse, and anxiety is growing. Right. So, make a long question shorter. Uh, are you seeing, uh, you know, in, in your research and your travels, etc., are you seeing places where there are cities or urban planners at work who seem to be getting ahead of this in some sort of way? And is it to you, is it about more decentralization? Okay. Uh, is it more centralization? What's going to help China overcome the ahead of this? Right. Yeah, um, my co-author will actually be much more qualified to answer this question. I'll try. Um, the Echo City movement, actually, not to be cynic, is really very much like all these various different waves of high-tech zones and development zones. Yeah. In fact, even the Chongming Island project yeah. fell apart completely yeah. because financing couldn't come together. Yeah. But that's not to say the cities haven't really looked at ways in which that sustainability can be addressed. So I'll give you two examples. One is um, uh, Wuxi, basically near Lake tai, Taihu, that in the last few years you begin to see these green algae that are really is a result of uh, 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 industrial pollution along the tributary. And that has been uh, significantly sort of uh, Reduce because of you know, the crisis state forced the local governments to take actions, and as well as the rise of uh, uh, the civil society in that field. In fact, if anything, I think Jen knows this much better in China that the civil society is perhaps most active in environmental areas, mm -hmm. and they have been much more uh, sort of uh, instrumental in pushing local governments to move in that direction. So another good example is. Um, Chengdu uh, that uh, goes in terms of wastewater treatment, investment, as well as uh, promoting more sort of what we call integrated transportation and land use planning so that you maintain that linkage between work and living and so that you wouldn't have to drive to work much more. So I actually won a uh, sort of a Habitat Prize uh, through UN um, Habitat, uh, UN CHS. So those are two cities that are probably doing quite well. Chengdu especially are doing quite well. And there are also a number of national organizations promoting this. But overall, what we are seeing is if you are familiar with the sort of what you call the Kuznet curve, that is that economic growth continues to be the primary priority, that the environmental concern would not rise 
on a wide scale until the growth level achieves, you know, sort of the economic well, uh, you know, uh, welfare achieves a certain level, as we have seen in many other countries. So we've had uh, American scholars, Western scholars going to Chinese cities, working with planners, and they, you know, tell Chinese planners that, you know, don't you know if you build all these rain roads, you're going to create all these congestions, and you're going to create all these um, uh, Pollution. The Chinese planners know it, but they say, you know, we got to do what the people want, right? On the other hand, you know, also the, another tricky point is automobile is also a very important industry. So many cities don't really want to limit that. So you have sort of this tension between promoting job growth and promoting economic growth as well as environmental issues. So I think lots of Chinese planners know that, but we say we got to learn from mistakes by doing it ourselves instead of just sort of looking at Western experience. And just before we take the other two questions, we have passed the 7 o'clock mark, so if any of you have to go, we will understand. Is it OK for you to stay with the Sure. If people, if people if people do go, um, after 7 o'clock, there's only one door through which you can exit. So I just want to warn you. They'll show you downstairs. The security will show you how to get out. But I think it's on the 27th Street side. Yeah, when you get out of the turnstile, you turn right, uh, and then you'll find the, uh, the exit. You go off the elevators, turn right, and right again. Just cross. Okay, I saw two hands. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Yuling. I'm working at the International High School in Westchester. I have a question uh, regarding you just uh, mentioned about uh, the foreign investment on China, China City, mm -hmm. especially in Shuzhou. Mm -hmm. And uh, this summer I visited Shuzhou and my friends told me um, currently so many complaints from Taiwan, from outsiders, and they move their complaints to inner China, to Chengdu. Okay. And then I also found another interesting thing is my school have a large um, group of kids from Vietnam mm -hmm. because those kids told me uh, the company they try to move from China to their to Vietnam and uh, which means I um, they start to move from Shuzhou to Chengdu and even if the capital the human capital is cheaper they may move their company to Vietnam mm -hmm. so I'm just wondering um, what's the future of those kind of city the second is I really found Shuzhou like 10 years ago. Shuzhou is a kind of medium-sized city. But in order to observe the foreign investment, they build up two wings outside right. of the city. Yeah, uh, Singapore so. Industry Park. Mm -hmm. And this, this is the same with Chengdu now. Mm -hmm. And they build up a new Chengdu in the south part of old Chengdu city. Mm -hmm. So what's, uh, you know, in future, how is this will effect uh, Overall, um, right? Yeah, really good uh, observation here. Um, I mean, that's not unique to China. I mean, if you look at, you know, particularly for those of us who uh, bought shoes in the last thirty years, and you first the shoes were made in Taiwan and South Korea, then you they are made in China. Now there are a lot of them are made in Vietnam and Cambodia, right? So a lot of these what we call labor-intensive uh, global production, you know, uh, uh, functions really move around seeking the cheapest labor as well as the least regulated space, right? So in China, you know, even in fact, uh, this sort of uh, Pearl River Delta area is fairly saturated in that fact, so we've moved up, now it's further moving west. It's all sort of uh, 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 the, the global flow of capital dictating that. And lots of cities, frankly, have a, a, not a whole lot of uh, choice. So that actually has been, uh, in a way, recognized. Uh, we see a lot more now in China. "Quote unquote," we have you know Chinese uh, slogans move from "Made in China" to "Innovated in China." So there is a recognition of the sort of the labor-intensive kinds of manufacturing is not the long-term uh, sort of uh, uh, engine of growth. And so, for instance, in Suzhou, you begin to see more uh, what we call ICT firms, um, information and communication technologies firms. So they are a little bit more capital intensive and technology intensive, so they can continue to attract firms that do not necessarily rely on just labor. 
and uh, it, it's the same thing with Shanghai. So in fact, Shanghai has basically got rid of all of its textile manufacturing facilities and, and, and decentralized all of them into Jiangsu province and even further. So what you are seeing here is a cycle of kinds of investment cycling through different levels of cities in China and then subsequently cycling through across China to other countries. But I think the key, because you were asking how the cities can continue to be attractive, is to move up to attract other uh, types of investment. That doesn't mean that all cities will be successful because you go to the southwest, or I'm sorry, southeast coast of South, uh, South Korea, you see a lot of the original towns that uh, produced for uh, Nike and Reebok and so on are no longer very important industrial sites because they are gone and we are not able to regenerate uh, to attract new industries. So some cities do become uh, uh, sort of like Detroit and so on of uh, industrial uh, wasteland. You seem really oh, I'm, I'm Ben Moore. Uh, you seem really sincere about statistics and exceptions to statistics, so maybe you're a good person to ask. Uh, how comfortable do you feel with the last Chinese census? Yeah, um, the best person to talk about that with is um, Ken Wen Chang, uh, who's a geographer at the University of Washington. And he really uh, looks into a lot of these various different ways of counting population. Um, but my understanding is um, census uh, uh, sources uh, are really for the very first time since 2000 include migrants and are, how shall we say, as good as you get. Okay? But another way to sort of confirm that is the every five year intercensus 1% population survey. That in a way is, um, I wouldn't say more accurate, but really quite reliable because it's a survey kind of, and it's done every 10 years, but in between census. And I have seen data at least on, not the total number of population, but rather on, for instance, housing ownership patterns, and the housing condition patterns, quite consistent, okay? Uh, so um, I have some confidence in using the census data. Uh, and I think the longer we use them, meaning, um, you know, like the 2000 to 2010, I expect to find 2010 even more reliable than the 2000 census. So as the sort of the expertise grows in collecting census data, uh, you know, if you look at how Chinese collect census, the kind of investment they put in, you know, lots of people get involved, college students, neighborhood committee members, and workers. It's a huge undertaking. And unlike here, census is by mail, and unless you don't return the form, you get a visit. In China, essentially, you get visit pretty much all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's a much more sort of door-to-door -door kind of effort. Uh, so I have some confidence. I, I, I would say. But I don't have any other data to use. Okay, any last question? If not, please all join me. Thank you very much.